today for a conversation about how uh, how Hollywood can become a greener industry and how Hollywood can help the world become a greener planet, uh, kind of in, it, perhaps in that order. <laughs> so thank you all so, ver so very much for joining us here today. We have a really good uh, collection of skill sets and disciplines. It should be a lively conversation. So I'm going to introduce first Heidi Kinberg. Director of Sustainability for HBO and HBO Max, uh, HBO's soon to launch uh, Younger Sibling. And uh, in addition to Heidi, we have Melissa Sun, Director of Entertainment Partnerships for the Sierra Club, a major advocacy group that has been in this space for a long time. So we're going to have a, a great perspective from Melissa. And also, we are very pleased to have with us Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali, who is an environmental activist. He serves as CEO of Revitalization Strategies, a company that tries to help bridge the gap of the green gap in lower income uh, and underprivileged communities. And he is also a vice president at the National Wildlife Federation. So thank you all for joining us today on, on a Saturday. We are, we are all indoors and doing this in a, in a virtual format. Um, again, appreciate you taking, taking the time. Let's just, let's start by talking about, uh, you know, kind of addressing the elephant in the room or the elephant in the Zoom, um, that we are all doing this virtually because we are in, in the midst of an unprecedented in, in the last century pandemic. Tell us how, let's start by telling how these um, lockdown and the coronavirus conditions have changed or, ch or challenged the work that you are trying to do in the environmental in the environmental area. Melissa, let's start with you. Sure, um, you know, my work sort of straddles that intersection of entertainment and advocacy. So <clears throat> on the advocacy side, you know, it's really helped shine a light on um, our equity work um, and shown how, uh, you know, the vulnerable communities um, on the front lines of climate change are also on the front lines of COVID. If you don't have um, clean water, wash your hands, how are you gonna stay healthy? Um, if you already have asthma and respiratory disease, how are you, um, you know, you're going to be more susceptible to COVID. Um, so it's really just sort of changed a lot of our work on that front. We're working a lot on um, a lot of different legislative issues, you know, protecting our environmental protections during the relief package negotiations, um, helping communities um, avoid utility shutoffs. Um, so that's the advocacy side. On the entertainment side, I also run our um, Arts and Entertainment Council, which is sort of our home for our supporters in the entertainment industry. And oddly enough, people seem to be more responsive right now. <laughs> you can get them on the phone, huh? I can get them on the phone. I mean, that's really the, the joy of having a council is that they know that we have a relationship and they answer the phone when we call. Um, but oftentimes, as you know, I mean, sometimes you know, I'll have an email that'll go unanswered for a month. Um, so right now people are, are quite responsive and uh, we just did this big Earth Day live live stream recently and we got a number of people to show up and participate in that. Um, you know, that Earth Day Live was produced by, you know, 500 different organizations, some of the good people who are right. doing the summit today. But um, um, yeah, they, they showed up because they didn't have to do it in person. Right, and that, is, that has been an interesting phenomenon. Um, Mustafa, I know this 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 epidemic, this pandemic has hit, you know, has hit the communities where you work very hard. I can only imagine the, you know, the steepness of the challenges that you're seeing right now. Yeah, it can be a very challenging moment, you know, but also an opportunity for us to do better. You know, uh, unfortunately, so many communities of color, lower wealth communities, and indigenous folks are actually losing not just single lives, but multiple lives sometimes within their families. And, you know, so being able to put a spotlight on these challenges, these disproportionate impacts that continue to happen in those communities um, becomes, you know, a little more difficult. Um, you can't get a, a crew to go out uh, and actually film. So folks are, you know, taking it upon themselves to do their own storytelling, which should always be the paradigm that we're operating from um, so that we can help to move resources into those communities so that we can also help to influence policy and the stimulus bills that are out there to make sure that they're actually meeting the needs that are going on uh, inside of communities. So it is a challenging moment, but it's also an opportunity for the country to finally pay attention um, to these impacts that have been happening for some 
uh, for hundreds of years for some communities, our indigenous brothers and sisters, and for others, you know, since we started the Industrial Revolution. It, it is, it's, it's, it's a moment when there, it, there is something of a leveler in that this is something that wealth and privilege can't protect you from. It is, you know, it, it has changed, uh, upended public life as we know it. Heidi, can you, you know, with, with so many productions shut down, I know that that just handling that in and of itself is, is a challenge for HBO folks. How, how have you, how's the pandemic most affected the work that you're doing? Well, I mean, like you said, it's shut down. So that's um, a first in my lifetime, my experience. And so that in and of itself is um, something that we're grasping. Um, and, you know, honestly, when I first started talking to people, the what they always said to me was, oh, bummer about the single use plastic water bottles. And the assumption was as soon as we go back to production, everything is going to be single use, including the water bottles. And, um, you know, it, interestingly, that was their first reaction to sustainability. Um, so what we're doing and what all the companies are doing in our industry and across the board is coming up with um, health and safety protocols for returning to work. And our sustainability groups are coming up with a sustainability version of that. So that when we do return to production, and we all do return to work, that we can do it in the most sustainable way. And we don't have to go back um, out of fear to those plastic water bottles, just using that as an example. Um, but we can find sustainable alternatives and we can say go to, you know, it's still safe to use refillable water, water bottles. If you need single use, go to can. There's ways to do this sustainably. So on um, a deeper level than just bottled water, we're looking at all of these um, at corporate and industry levels. Um, so that when we return, it's not going back to normal and it's not an interim thing, but it's creating a new normal where these sustainable behaviors and ways of doing work um, continue on. Wow, I am glad to hear you say that because uh, the last week there has been, it's very clear that, that Hollywood, especially on the West Coast, is getting ready to, is, is starting the process of looking at what going back to work or what going back to production looks like. But I have to say, things that I'm hearing are things like that sound like could be a horror show of single, you know, individually packaged craft services meals and, you know, uh, you know, single use water bottles can't bring in food from the outside. Um, yeah, these these guidelines I know are in the formative stages, but do you feel like and, and I'd love to hear from, you know, do you feel like. My, my concern is that in a crisis moment, people are saying, oh, we, we, we can't afford, you know, we can't afford the luxury of sustainability. Do you think that that is a danger? Uh, no, I think it's an opportunity. I mean, just like the water bottle example, yes, they might be serving prepackaged food, but you can not order red meat and you can put it in compostable to-go to containers. Um, you know, there's workarounds for all of these. And like I said, our sustainability industry group is working on guidelines and recommendations to address those and other issues that have to do with like PPE and the disposal, disposal of that and um, opportunities where it looks like everybody's gonna go digital and stop printing. And this is mm -hmm. something we've been working on for a long time. And this might be a moment to um, finally, you know, succeed at doing that um, in full. And so, uh, you know, looking across the board, of course, keeping the health and safety protocols in mind first, uh, but then applying the most sustainable uh, version of that is, is our goal. Mm -hmm. um, just say, like, it seems like a really exciting time to strip things down and really rebuild and look at the essential needs of production and really the, go back to basics because there was just, you know, I know you've been working really hard, Heidi, but there's, there is so much ways, but it, it is exciting to think that they might start thinking about it on an as needs basis. Well, it, it is just an, un, you know, nobody three months ago could have predicted this, but it is just an, uh, it, the, the urgency feels so strong to act because this is an unprecedented shutdown of so much, so much television was, was shut down, even uh, television and film production, but even the television that you are seeing, the live, the, the, the newscasts and the talk shows are being produced in a very different way. This is an unprecedented reset and especially it seems also the opportunity is great because especially as you come back slowly is a chance to you know to see what works and try you know try new practices and 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 hope and hope for the best i don't know if if any of you have heard of anything um in other parts of the world that are you know slowly starting to come back like parts of europe south south korea i don't know if, you, if there's been any practices there that you're aware of that have that have 
that have been that seem like you know um, big steps forward for sustainability. Well, this this is myself. If I could just chime in real quick to to kind of anchor, you know, our conversation and the reality that's going on, on on the ground and why we need this new paradigm that I hope will be a part of the new normal. You know, when we talk about plastic pollution, you know, we understand that there's huge impacts in our oceans, but also majority of solid waste landfills, you know, if someone's not practicing, you know, recycling at the levels that we need, that goes into lower income and, and communities of color, you know, and our energy sources that we use when folks are filming or putting a production on, you know, the majority of the um, coal-fired power plants and, and some of the other electric generating facilities they're all primarily located inside of communities of color and lower wealth communities. So as we begin to make this change, we are benefiting the planet, but we also have the opportunity to actually make a real difference in the lives of communities of color, lower wealth communities and indigenous populations. And sometimes we need to make sure that we're anchoring it in the reality of what we can actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, folks will say, well, turn off the light switch or, or do something else and we leave that conversation right there and we sometimes forget that those actions can actually be transferable and helping to actually save people's lives. You know, the, the, poten the potential for, you know, the virtuous circle of, of being able to stop that kind of just, just you know, pollution, pollution, the racially tinged pollution, as well as the ability to, you know, to, to generate green jobs, to bring people into the system as, as small business people with, you know, with, with an, an array of green opportunities, it just seems so, um, so, the potential is so great. What in your experience for all of you in, in the various aspects of the business, what is it that drives, what is it that drives change? Is it somebody with power, a star, a producer getting behind it and say, my sets are gonna have bamboo compostable utensils? Like, what is it that, that that makes people, you know, um, sit up and take notice and take those those small steps that lead to that lead to larger change. In your experience, um, I'll jump in real quick. Uh, it's everything, right? I mean, you need the top down. You need it to be coming from the corporate or even from um, bigger than that levels, policy levels and whatnot. And then you need the grassroots. You need every crew member in in my particular, uh, you know, area to participate. Um, but I think what drives big change is um, a great example of success story of this is we have a, a phenomenal uh, industry uh, partner group, the Sustainable Production Alliance. And um, a decade ago or so, um, Sony Pictures started looking at the impact of making productions and they realized quickly that um, the Luan or the plywood that we use to build the set walls had the biggest negative uh, impact in regard to biodiversity. So working with a nonprofit partner, TFT, we started looking at the supply chain all the way back to the forests and the mills in Indonesia and Malaysia, all the way through to the retailers where our shows purchased this ply. And um, contrary to our initial instinct, which was let's stop buying this unsustainable product, the solution became let's make it a sustainable supply chain. So we started talking with our construction coordinators and again with the retailers and whatnot, but real change happened when all of the studios got on board and collectively we talked to our, our construction coordinators, our executives, our producers, our re uh, retailers and whatnot, because the voice was so much louder. Um, and so long story short and a lot of work a few years later, um, FSC Luan or sustainably certified you know, Luan is available throughout North America um, in our key shooting markets. And there's another alternative that we've vetted and there's sustainable products available in Europe and, and whatnot. So um, you know, it really collectively our efforts uh, working together changed an entire supply chain that had been in existence for a long time. That's amazing. Do you know what the impetus for the creation of the Sustainable Production Alliance was? Because that seems like that was the fulcrum for making it happen. Um, yeah, I mean, back when, you know, a decade ago when sustainability started becoming a word and a thing at the corporate level and all of that, um, the studios, the big six in particular, um, were all working on their own programs. They were very similar, but they were, you know, in their own silos. Um, and um, we realized we have a transient workforce, you know, and so somebody might be on an HBO show today, but on a Warner Brothers show tomorrow or, you know, different 
studio. Right. So we came Both together. Both actor or crew, you know, it very Everybody. much so, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we came together under the banner of the Producers Guild of America and decided to create uh, like tools. So we had a common language. We um, could compare apples to apples, so to speak. We had a common you know, carbon calculator. And that was the beginning of it. Uh, and then now that Sustainable Production Alliance has grown to include um, also most of the major content producers. So all the big streamers and whatnot are also part of that group now. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. Um, let's talk a little bit, let's talk about sort of the role of storytelling in, you know, both bringing awareness to this crisis and, and you know, dramatizing the, the many aspects of it. Um, Mustafa, we were talking earlier just before, before the panel started about there are, you, you're saying there's no shortage of amazing heroic stories of people trying to make change, people in adverse circumstances standing up, calling, you know, calling out environmental racism when they see it. Um, what in your experience, what, what is key to bringing awareness to a particular story? Is it to have a, a Hollywood celebrity or somebody of note get behind that story and start talking about it in media, you know, free media, social media, that kind of thing? How, how do you think we can help get some of these stories a platform? Well, I think one is, you know, and I know it's, people's schedules are always really busy, but I think it's actually making sure that folks are spending time in these communities, working with the environmental justice networks and, and other organizations that are out there to hear what's going on. You know, what are you hearing about? And, and some of these stories are, you know, sometimes there's, there's terrible tragedy, but there's also incredible triumph um, that reminds you of, as we were talking earlier, you know, of some of the you know, shows that, that have played for years and years. When you go to places like Cancer Alley, you know, the, between New Orleans and Louisiana, the stories that are there of an area founded by freed slaves, a thriving African-American community, and then petrochemical facilities come in for as far as the eye can see. And all of a sudden, you know, you have multitudes of people having, you know, these various cancers. And then the fights that were there, you know, the David versus Goliath situations where you have these small communities you know, have to go up against these horse, uh, you know, corporations and their attorneys and these types of things and, and the struggle and the fights and the small wins. And you go to places like the Manchester community, Houston, Texas, you know, primarily Latino community, where when you go there, you literally feel like you're breathing in gasoline fumes. These are real stories of real people that will touch folks uh, and help make change happen. Just like Standing Rock helped to shift the culture Flint shifted the culture. So when we get these real stories about real people, um, then it is a game changer. And yes, it's great if you have, you know, a big name star who's behind it or begins to help with the campaigns. All of that coming together can make change happen. But we got to anchor it in the reality of what's really going on on the ground and then tie it to how it's also a driver in climate change. And it's also, unfortunately, a driver in what's going on with COVID-19 and the lives that are being lost. So we've got real opportunities to do good and do well at the same time. At a time when, when people are, so, are focused on, you know, just basic human needs in a way that they, that they aren't, you know, maybe aren't always during, you know, more flush times. It really is, it does feel like on a lot of levels, this is, you know, this is a moment to be, to absolutely be called. Um, let me ask. I, I, oh, add on to that, that, um, I feel like the news media has done a great job of making these connections and starting to tell these stories. I mean, just in the past four years since Trump went into office, they've been, you know, really doing a great job. Journalists have been in, in um, you know, embedding themselves and um, making these connections. Um, but pop culture and entertainment media really has a lot of catching up to do. And I've done a lot of thinking about this. There just is a huge gap that we need to bridge. And I'm not sure where the problem actually lies. I mean, entertainment in and of itself is a for-profit business um, and it has a longer lead time. And, you know, without them making a profit, they don't exist. So we have to understand what their goals and then we have to, you know, understand what advocacy goals are, which is moving legislation. And so bringing those two together and having them work together um, is not simple, <laughs> but, but, you know, I'm, 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 again, I'm, I'm bringing out a problem, but these are, these are things that we try to, you know, that I work every day on. And um, there have been 
instances where this has worked, um, you know, Mark Ruffalo's film Dark Waters right. um, has been really, really great about making direct connections to, you know, a story that happened 20 years ago, um, the small time attorney going up against DuPont, you know, the biggest chemical plant in the, in the country. Um, and then, you know, winning this case, and, and it still goes on till today. These are problems that are still happening. And they have run this great impact campaign and have done, you know, local screens. We've hosted quite a few of them ourselves um, in a lot of different communities and making those direct connections to what's happening in people's communities and giving them opportunity to learn and take action. So anytime that you can actually attach an action or make a direct connection to what's happening right now is when I feel like you can make the biggest impact. Um, but, you know, studios with most studios on most major films consider it a liability to make that connection. They don't want to politicize their films or over overshadow the, the film's general marketing. Um, and, you know, especially in the first or second wave of promotion. So it can be really difficult to sort of um, utilize those as tools in the advocacy world in the, in, at, the, at the moment where it can matter the most. Well, it, it, go ahead, Patty. Sorry, thanks. I'll say another angle is to weave it into mainstream content and not necessarily have a story entirely about an environmental issue. Um, and there's some shows that do this really well. Everybody's probably heard about the Pretty Little Liars episode. And then the Blacklist has um, always been successful at weaving in these, you know, these topics into their really um, not environmental <laughs> based shows. Um, and another thing that we talk about a lot is um, putting sustainable behaviors and messaging on screen in order to normalize it. So what we mean by that without getting into the content or the creative side of things, is getting characters to say, carry the refillable bottle instead of the plastic or order a vegan meal instead of a meat based meal or um, you know, meet at a coffee shop that has fair trade signage in the window. We were talking about just the general sense, the general theme of impact and what, what in visual media, in TV and film and digital storytelling, what really has impact. And I'd like to talk about, you know, I, I talk to people that are so dedicated into the, environmental space and they feel like as great as there are so many great documentaries and there are some that break through and have real impact obviously um, but documentaries tend to be preaching to the choir sometimes if somebody is going to sit down and watch a climate change documentary they're invested in the issue already whereas weaving a story into a narrative piece and, and as uh, one of the panelists mentioned earlier sometimes not even just even just modeling the behavior of sustainability of recycling or, you know the most simple the most simple things let's I, I would love to get a sense from the panelists about where what kind of media what kind of storytelling you've seen has had the most impact in raising awareness and kind of touching hearts on these most you know um, scary issues Melissa oh <laughs> yeah. um, let me think of specific things. Um, uh, I'll jump in while you're thinking. Yes, you I'll, so I think the beauty of this panel is that we're all coming at it from different angles and all these angles, um, you know, are attractive to different people. And so that's the beauty. There's, I'm a big fan of cause marketing. It's not my wheelhouse, but I really appreciate it and think it's powerful. Um, and it takes a, a title that has a particular audience and then a nonprofit organization with a particular cause and authentically puts those together. Um, and so that reaches double the audience, if not more. Uh, so those are really interesting opportunities. And then back to my, what I was kind of saying, um, for our break was that um, <laughs> was that I think that it's really important to weave it into just mainstream content because then you're just reaching uh, those people uh, again in an organic natural way it has to fit into the content and with the character and all of that. Heidi can you give us a good example of that marriage of project and cause marketing anything that comes to mind? Sorry I have dogs. Um, okay. <laughs> so yeah and, and I'll just preface it with I give us some Sony examples because I was at Sony for a decade and three mm -hmm. days before the pandemic I moved to HBO. So um, I am mm -hmm. uh, working on, on HBO and HBO Max shows now but a lot of my experience has been with Sony um, over the course of my sustainable production uh, career. Uh, so one great example is the Angry Birds campaign which they did with the UN. So it was to promote the, the uh, sustainable development goals and um, you know that was a really widespread campaign. It hit the Angry Birds audience. It had the UN, which is phenomenal. 
Uh, and that was an animated film, a, mm -hmm. an animated feature film from about four or five years ago or so, or mm -hmm. soon, yeah. Yeah, yeah, roughly. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so. This is Mustafa, you know, I, I work in so many different worlds. So, you know, I spent two years at the Hip Hop Caucus, which was incredible. And, and there I got a chance to, to work with and see all of these incredible artists in the hip hop world and some other worlds utilizing video, um, which is a part of our conversation, um, you know, in the development of that. So you had incredible artists like Common doing Trouble in the Water. You had Taboo um, in The Magnificent Seven doing uh, Stand Up for Standing Rock, which won an MTV Music Award. So that actually helped to move the culture. I can't tell you how many young people I'm walking through the airport or wherever it was, you know, who actually saw that and knew the connections that were there began to ask questions. And teachers were actually utilizing it to, um, you know, to actually train some of the students on some of the issues that were going on. And then it also helped to move on the policy lens as well. Or you have on the animation side, you know, if you have Dora the Explorer, which had all kinds of really positive messages weave throughout it. Um, or you have, you know, what NWF's doing with uh, Ranger Rick uh, and animations and other things that are happening in that space. There are lots of different ways for us to get at this that actually meets people where they are uh, and helps to make change happen. And I mean, do you, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Melissa. I was going to say, you know, there there are so many different formats of telling story, and um, you know, documentaries do a great job of you know helping people go in depth, um, people who are interested in subjects and learning more. Um, but in terms of you know reaching new people, I do think it's really important to find ways of normalizing um, some of these issues so that people can see how it touches on our daily lives. Um, I was having an interesting conversation with one of the writers on my arts and entertainment council. His name is Andrew Reich. He's a brilliant, um, mm -hmm. you know, Com positive comedy writer. writer yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, you know, we're trying to figure out why is this so challenging and how can we make climate change funny? And he said, we need to find the Cam and Mitchell of climate change. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Cam and Mitchell are from, you know, Modern Family. And, you know, they just are. They're like any other couple. You know, they love, they fight, you know, they, you know, it's just, it, it's a way of just normalizing every, you know, and I think that's been part of the, the problem because when you're telling these stories, they tend to be, you know, set in dystopian, yeah. you know, eras or in post-apocalyptic post worlds. And um, it's really hard to make it now, right now, outside your living room. It's the storm that you see outside, it's, you know, um, the car that you drive, it's um, the t-shirt that you're wearing, all of these different ways that you can integrate it into your story. And those are just small little details that, um, you know, add up over time. And, you know, in terms of overall um, impact, you know, I look at things at like the back end, which is physical production and how we're producing these things and how we can lighten our footprint. And then there's the front end and looking at the product itself and sort of you know, we want to push our, you know, content makers to, to be, you know, more responsible with it, just like we would with any other consumer product, where you're really thinking about what is the message that you're putting out there, you know, is, you know, misinformation can be, you know, uh, you know, have the opposite effect when you're trying to dramatize something, but you can create anxiety and fear and really lead to inaction in some of these cases. Um, so you just kind of, you know, want to push them to do better and, um, be more mindful of some of the messages that we're putting out there for people. And, um, you know, there, ha there have been people working really hard at this and there's just no silver bullet. <laughs> but I I'm happy that the conversations are happening and we're trying to figure it out. I mean, I think one of the things that is challenging that, and when I was researching our, our climate change package that, that we published, that Variety published last fall, um, was challenging in this country especially in the last four years, is that climate change itself, the, the discussion has become politicized. Yeah. And it was, when I was spoke, speaking to people for the stories, it was very interesting. They met, you know, longtime climate change activists pointed out that in Europe, there were lots of very vigorous political debates about the policies that should be applied, that should be approved, the policies that should be pursued to, to mitigate and how they would go about it. But there wasn't that essential roiling debate about whether it even happened. Whereas in this country, so much energy and time from the news media, from 
you know, other uh, from from policymakers just just went into just fighting the science versus the deniers. That um, do you have you find and, and Mustafa also in your work? I mean, are people is the politicization of the issue in this country the unique level of politicking that goes around this? Is this at all a turnoff to people in terms of like? They can see it as, you know, I don't know, this isn't something I want to get involved in. Has that been an issue at all that in your experience, the concern about the, the politics around it? Um, I mean, I would say yes to a degree, but I think that it's evolving and changing. Um, you know, uh, you're finding now that there's a new generation of leaders, um, young people. This is just a part of their lexicon. You know, it's a, it's a part of how they see the world, how they um, approach uh, a new and better uh, sets of opportunities, not only for our country, but for the planet. Um, but you do see some of that politics in other countries as well. Brazil's a great example um, where, you know, there is definitely, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, a separation between some folks. But with all that being said, in this moment now with COVID-19, it's helping everyone to better understand, you know, the importance of clean air, especially because, you know, they're paying attention to how the virus travels. And now we also know that it's also tied to air pollution in certain places and people becoming more vulnerable because of chronic medical conditions. People are also, for the first time, maybe as, uh, you know, we were getting deep into the virus, you know, finding that it was more difficult to get food. So people are paying more attention to food justice issues and access and all these things. So we have a moment now, once again, where we can connect it and, and get the politics out of it because everybody has to deal with some of these issues that are going on. So I see it as a moment where we can really help to not just educate folks, but actually move the culture in a way that says, if we truly want our country to be stronger and better, this is one of the ways that we can make that happen. Oh boy, I hope you are right, for sure. Um, we are going to shift. We have had some uh, questions submitted by participants in this in this uh, summit. So we are going to shift now to a couple of questions that have been uh, that were submitted in advance. Hi, my name is Tiffany Rouse. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a film student. And what I find to be most challenging when trying to make sets more sustainable are two main things, time and money. Um, it's often quite hectic on set, so when people have a short break and grab a bite at the crafty table, the last thing on their mind is recycling the water bottle that they have in their hands because they're moving on to do different tasks. So that's one of the main problems. And another thing is that student films are often um, very low budget. So what can I do to make my sets more sustainable in light of this filmmaking culture that often has so little time and so little money to spare? I'll jump in. So sometimes low budget or student films um, are inherently more sustainable. Um, so you have that going for you. And um, you mentioned time and money. Um, you know, you don't typically um, make, you know, build big sets or travel across, across the globe. So um, you have that going for you as well. So what can you do for little to no money? Um, the Green Production Guide uh, on greenproductionguide.com, it's called Peach, is a list of sustainable best uh, practices broken out by department. And you can follow most of those and they don't have a financial impact. They're just behavior changes. Uh, you can enforce no idling. You cannot serve red meat. You cannot provide those single use water bottles. Um, even moving forward, you can't, you know, cannot print um, compost, recycle on set, all of these things aren't necessarily, uh, they don't have a financial impact. Um, and I will say that AFI has done a phenomenal job of taking the industry level documents that all of the big uh, content producers have collectively made and tweaking them for their film students. So you could do the same thing. Um, they're also uh, forming a film school alliance um, based, you know, modeled after our sustainable production alliance uh, because they want to have this conversation uh, for film students. And the best part about this, and the reason why I wanted to be part of this panel and this uh, event, and I talk with uh, film schools and students um, as much as I can, is because if you do these things, um, and as you're coming up into the industry and into your careers, um, our end goal is to have sustainable production just be production. 
So um, again, a lot of these behaviors that you can find in our best practices, you can apply. Um, and it's just those kinds of changes not, necess not necessarily have a, um, a financial impact. Mm -hmm. oh, those are great resources. Thank you. All right, let's take the next one. Hey guys, I'm Jess. Um, welcome to my childhood bunk bed. Uh, she, her, hers. Um, I'm a freelance producer. And uh, basically my question is, as a freelancer, you know, going from set to set, your workplace is often changing. Um, and with every new show, there's a new set of rules. Although some of those rules, like wearing closed-toed shoes, for example, like always go unspoken. Um, and my question is, how can we make maintaining a green set one of those rules? Uh, Jess asks, asks a good question. You know, how do you how do you make um, sustainability and green practices? How do you, you know, how, how can an individual who may move from set to set help that become ingrained? Uh, yeah, I'll jump in again. Sorry. Um, I love this question. And like I just uh, mentioned, it's really our end goal is to um, have it become standardized across, uh, which is why we started our uh, our collective uh, group in the first place, uh, like I mentioned, was to have common language, have common practices. Um, and, you know, five, six, eight years ago, this was new. All of our conversations were for the first time. And I will tell you that now everybody's familiar with the tools that we ask them to use. Everybody's familiar with the language. Uh, so we hope that it's becoming more and more standard. And then as companies, most of them, um, you know, have their own sustainable production programs now. So it's coming from the corporate, from the executives to the productions, um, you know, so hopefully it just gets more and more embedded into the, the main way, just the regular way to do production. Mm -hmm. Melissa, do you have anything, does the Sierra Club do anything with, with student outreach, any kind of educational outreach that might also, you know, feed into this? Yeah, um, we're part of a coalition of groups um, that work on this. We're a resource for writers and producers who are interested in weaving climate change into their stories. So when you're looking at the back end and production principles, you know, I, I just encourage you to also look at the front end and looking at the characters that you're portraying, the stories that you're telling, the environments in which um, you're setting your stories and how you can create, you know, a new positive normal. And, and we're here for you as a resource. I am here. Call me anytime. Um, if you need, you know, a thought partner or brainstorming, um, we want to help you work through some of these challenges and, and make it easy for you and provide resources and data where we can. And Melissa, you are based in the San Francisco area. So people yep. can reach you through Sierra Club in, in the San Francisco area. Yep, melissa.sierraclub.org. <laughs> Great, she's given it out there. Um, de I'll folks be definitely take advantage of it. My last question for you before we go is the, you know, speaking to, you know, the audience that we have for young entertainment activists. What is your sense in terms of the level of engagement on this issue by the younger generations, the millennials, the post-millennials. I mean, my, my anecdotal sense is that it is very high, but I'd love to hear, uh, Mustafa, tell me, if, you know, in the communities that you work in, these are, you know, in many cases, you know, these are people that are already living in difficult conditions. Is there, do you see a, a, a continued level of engagement on these issues? Oh, there's a huge amount of engagement. There, there's still work, of course, to be done. But, you know, young people who are growing up in these situations, they see it each and every day and they're trying to figure out um, how to make real change happen. And then, you know, we also have other incredible youth organizations that are out there. We have the Sunrise Movement. We have This Is Zero Hour. We have the Extinction Movement, First Fridays, um, and a number of other, I mean, Fire Drill Fridays, excuse me, First Fridays. I'd have to give Ice Cube some credit for that one. <laughs> but um, just incredible uh, youth leaders who are, are changing. You know, they're, they're changing our culture. And I keep talking about the shifting of our culture in a very positive direction uh, to be intentional about the steps that need to happen, but also about the inclusiveness of making sure that we help everyone move from surviving to thriving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, um, my God, there are this, this topic, as, you, as we all know, has so, many, has so many angles to it. We could go on for another hour easily on many things, but I just wanted to to uh, th first of all, thank profusely the panelists for your time and for hanging in there with us with our minor, minor technical glitch. 
and I really just to everybody who is is watching now and hopefully will watch in the future, I just want to remind that you know the the basically kind of what we know the sort of the state of the art of climate science right now is that we have about a ten year window to make real change to keep global warming from going above that two degrees Celsius threshold that on the other side of that looks looks scarier than any post-apocalyptic movie that we've seen. And I just, I, I just, I charge you folks, you are the future. This industry is in at, a, at an unprecedented sort of reset moment and all of your energy, bringing your own water bottle onto a set, although that may might be challenged in the immediate going back to work. Long-term, there are things that you can do there, this industry should absolutely be leading. And thanks to some of the people we've had on this panel, it, it has, but it's really, it's in your hands. And so I, hope, I thank everybody for hanging in there with us and uh, hope, hope that uh, people reach out to Mustafa and get some of those great stories. Hope people reach out to Melissa and get resources. Heidi is clearly a force for good in green Hollywood. And we thank all of you for all of your great work and thank you all for, for uh, listening today. My name is Marina Frugone. This is the Regeneration Garden Club at Los Angeles City College. I'm a UC Master Gardener and a student of landscape architecture. It was fall semester. I was really, really stressed out. And so I had to walk out of class and I came here. I stumbled upon another member of the garden and she was also having a really hard day. She was in tears and she came here as a place where she could heal and feel calm again. And that's the point really of this garden here and I think of many gardens is not only it nourishes you and it teaches you how to take care for things, but it also really takes care of you on so many levels. On a climate level, on a world level, community gardens cut down on transportation costs for food. The chain of farmer to grocery store to you gets cut down. It's just a direct connection with yourself and the food that you eat. If you live in an area that's a designated food desert, even more so, it's so important to connect with people that are doing this in your community. You can create a space of multiple people that can be self-reliant. And I think that's part of a regenerative practice and moving away from dependency on institutions that perhaps haven't been there for us all of the time. We're gonna transplant a pepper today. So this is a pepper plant and we're gonna be transplanting this into a larger container. So these are the roots and they're starting to take the shape as the container, that's when you want to transplant. So I'm digging a hole right now where the pepper is going to go. That's about right. And you want to loosen up the roots around it. And then you're going to pat tightly around the pepper plant. And if you look, the soil is pretty loose. It has sand, it has little barks, and all of that is going to help the water flow and it's going to keep the right amount of air inside the soil. And then you water. The act of growing something from start, seeing it bloom and go through its life cycle, it's very gratifying and it's very soulful. There are a lot of plants that you can grow in your windowsill. You don't have to have a bed or a huge garden to be able to do that. And there are a lot of YouTube tutorials that can show you how to grow your own food in smaller containers. Even though it's going to be a smaller quantity, I think it's the act of doing it yourself that gives you a sense of empowerment. That's the ultimate goal in gardening personally. You're cultivating independence in yourself and you're creating the capacity to believe in yourself to be able to do something. It changes people's lives. It gives people a moment in the day where they can start healing for themselves and others as well. Cham cha pa cham mai om cha kui kui cham. Cham cha pa cham mai om cha kui kui cham. 
Cham chapa cham amayom chikli skwi cham. Cham chapa cham amayom chikli skwi cham. Sacred Places Institute for Indigenous Peoples works to build the capacity of Native nations and Indigenous peoples to protect sacred lands, waters, and cultures. To me, environmental justice is giving voice to the Native people and then in return honoring that voice. The Indigenous people of said land, their stories, their ways, they understand that land. My hope is that we can all have that understanding and that we have to protect what is sacred so that we can leave the land right for the future generations to come. SPI partnered with Sherman Indian High School and Anahuacalmeca International Baccalaureate World School to create the Indigenous Youth Environmental Justice Program. The Indigenous Youth Environmental Justice Program holds events for youth to develop skills and express themselves regarding environmental justice issues in their homelands and where they attend school. COVID-19 forced students out of the classroom onto online platforms. This has been an extreme disruption for our Native youth, especially those in rural areas without internet or computers. SPI seeks to supply students from our partner schools with tablets so they can continue to engage with their environmental justice peers remotely. Visit our website at www.sacredplacesinstitute.org slash events.html for more information on how you can support this effort. Thank you. Graphics powered by Hovercast. Streaming powered by Wirecast.